DiscerningHearts.com. In cooperation with the Missionary Benedictines of Christ the King Priory presents The Holy Rule of St. Benedict, A Spiritual Path for Today's World with Father Mauritius Fildi. Father Mauritius did his philosophical, theological, and doctoral studies in Europe. He is the author of numerous books, including I Want to Understand You, Encountering Foreign Worlds with a Little Prince, The New Image of God's Image, Meister Eckhart on Image and Theology, Peter and Paul, Models of Decision Making, and On the Way, Benedict's Journey for Spiritual Maturity. Father Mauritius serves as the prior of St. Anselm's in Rome. The Holy Rule of St. Benedict, a spiritual path for today's world with Father Mauritius Fildi. I'm your host, Chris McGregor. Welcome, Father Mauritius. Thank you for having me. A rather provocative topic we'll be undertaking in this discussion on the Holy Rule of St. Benedict, a very important one that's in place of self-righteousness, seeking God. What would be the definition of self-righteousness? Self-righteousness says somebody is very certain about the fact that he is right. And the others, probably not. <laughs> mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. How does the Holy Rule help someone and the community with this particular disposition? The Rule helps from the very beginning because the Rule teaches the brothers that the principle or the main criteria for becoming a monk is if the person really seeks God. And it is not the criteria if the person has found God. I would like to read this to you from from chapter 58, The Procedure for Receiving Brothers. Do not grant newcomers to the monastic life an easy entry, but as the Apostle says, test the spirits to see if they are from God. Therefore, if someone comes and keeps knocking at the door, and if at the end of four or five days he has shown himself patient in bearing his harsh treatment and difficulty of entry, and has persisted in his request, then he should be allowed to enter and stay in the guest quarters for a few days. After that, he should live in the novitiate where the novices study, eat, and sleep. A senior chosen for his skill in winning souls should be appointed to look after them with careful intention. The concern must be whether the novice truly seeks God and whether he shows eagerness for the work of God, for obedience and trials. The novice should be clearly told all the hardships and difficulties that will lead him to God. St. Benedict talks about the assessment. What are the things the young man, the young person that wants to enter the monastery has to bring? And this is really striking for me that he doesn't say, this man must have found God in his life or must be a good Catholic (laughs) or something like that. At that time there were no were only Catholics. Mm -hmm. The concern must be whether the novice truly seeks God. I think St. Benedict said this purposely because this involves a kind of humility and the humility is the remedy against the self-righteousness. So the vocation minister or the novice master until today would first look if the respective person is open for God, is seeking God, is longing for God, and because that, mean, that means he is open for development, he's open for growth. But those people who come and say, say oh, for me it's very clear what the Catholic faith is and what, what, who God is, this is all clear, and I believe it. Hmm... If this happens, the novice master is a little bit hesitant to give admission. 
And that also goes back to the gospel. When the young man came to Jesus and asked him, what shall I do to gain in order to gain the kingdom of God and to get into heaven? And Jesus said, very cool, he said, oh, you know the commandments? One, two, three, four. Oh, yes, I did this all. I, you know, pff, I know them from my youth. I, I follow all these commandments. But Jesus is not satisfied with this answer. It's very interesting. He says, one thing is still missing. You should give away everything, give your wealth away to the poor, and then come and follow me. Oh, that was too much for the young man. So what Jesus did, that was provocative. He mm -hmm. wanted this young man to be open for further developments in his spiritual life. This would have been the beginning of a seeking God. So the danger of the attitude, I know who God is, I have found God, the danger of this, I call it self-righteousness, is that you pretend to control God to hold him, to have him in your pockets. But you cannot, because God is greater, way greater. You never, never, ever can say, I have got him, I have him in my pockets. You cannot. And if we encounter people who say something like this, they wouldn't say it with these words, but the attitude comes across <laughs> that they know exactly, exactly what God thinks and what what he wants to do and not to do. and Mostly these people use God in order to control others because they are kind of in the position of God. If you say, I know who God is, then, then you are God. Mm -hmm. And Jesus is very clear that he says, nobody knows who the Father is, only the Son. And the one to whom the Son has revealed it, but still... We are human beings, and this kind of humility that we still seek God, and thanks to God, once in a while I'll find also find Him also. I will come to this in a minute. But this is a very important foundation for spiritual life. This is where you can start building your spiritual house. And I think we should see it not not as a as a big challenge, it's actually a relief for me because when you promise to stay in the monastery forever, it's really hard to promise this. But I can promise and commit myself to always seeking God. This is what I never want to stop doing, never ever. And maybe that helps also for, for other kind of relationships. For example, when you get married, you promise to love your spouse, but this includes that you are always seeking him or her, that you are always seeking the love. It's hard to promise, I will love you all the time. <laughs> I don't know if this is really possible, but what you can do is you can promise to seek this love and never to cease to seek it. So if you have lost it, and that happens <laughs> mm -hmm. in between on the way, if you have lost the love, then our vow is to come back and to seek it again until you have found it again. So this is a dynamic concept of religious life and spiritual life in general. Do you think that... There is, a, there is a fear that if I don't control it, nothing will control it, and that chaos, essentially, causes pain for me, for people around me. So I know what I know what I know. That can cause problems as well, can mm -hmm. it? I'm very thankful that you mentioned this. I would say so. Underneath the self-righteousness, there is the fear. And the only remedy against the fear is the love. So when you encounter somebody who is so righteous in a negative way, and you say to him, no, you are not right, and God is bigger, and you only want to control him, that will make him angry. <laughs> mm -hmm. 
But if you love him in the way he is, maybe then he can open up. And the same is true if you look at yourself, when you find yourself as self-righteous. And I, I know what I'm talking about. Um, the only remedy is that you believe in the love of God. He will help you to let go this control. St. Benedict says that in the beginning of the monastic journey, we follow the rules out of fear. But the longer we are in the monastery, the more we follow the rule out of love and kind of naturally. So, in a way, any religious journey starts with this self-righteousness, maybe has to start like this, because in the beginning we have to control ourselves and to hold on to something we are certain of. But the longer we march, the more we see how good God is, how generous he is, how forgiving he is, how different he is, <laughs> as we have thought. And this all helps us to relax, in a good way, to relax and to give in to God's love. And to stay in this mode of seeking God, seeking God, looking for him. Where is he? He wants to be, he wants to be here for me. He wants to be present for me, for my sake. Where is he? So this would be the, the goal, to always seek the Lord. Seeking and this more humble approach that Jesus teaches us is actually more effective <laughs> for evangelization. Our life is a journey. We are traveling. There is no standstill. We are always on the way. So that means we change. And that means the people around us change as well. So if you would say, I have found God, okay, maybe you have found him at that moment. <laughs> but what is tomorrow when the situation has changed, when you have changed? I think the best kind of continued effort should be to seek God because this keeps us open for the changes in ourselves and the changes around us. Jesus saw the potential of change in those two women. He, he respected that they are still on a journey. It is not yet the last judgment, the day of the, of the final judgment. No, it is not. We are still on our journey and wandering. So I think this seeking God also fits to the fact that our life is a journey and that we are continuously journeying. Or think about the mountain of the transfiguration, you know. Peter thought, now I have got it, now we have got it. Let's build the houses, let's keep this, you know. No, there was no way to keep that. He had to go down from the mountain and <laughs> continue living. He certainly never forgot this, this moment. And we all are also blessed that on our way we experience kind of an eternal standstill in terms of, wow, God is here. This is how God is. And nothing is lacking. There's no dynamic anymore. It's just clear. And I'm in the truth. So I'm not saying that we don't have those moments. And I, I hope everybody... I'm sure everybody had them and is still having them. But the the day-to-day -day exercise is to seek God. Maybe I give you another approach to this topic. While we are seeking, we are already in contact with what we are seeking. Because as you are seeking, you are already connected with what you are seeking. So when I seek God, then I long for God. And in a way, he is already present when I long for him. Sometimes he's more present in this mode compared to when I, I'm pretty sure I have he is here now. So I say this kind of as a consolation. If we, if we don't come 
further than in this life than to seek God, it is already something because seeking God, it's exciting to seek God. It's so exciting. It's never boring because God is so great that you can look everywhere actually to, <laughs> in order to find him. It's interesting, I, that moment with the woman caught in adultery. When you think of the townspeople, the men in particular, some of whom we would presume what they felt were righteous men who mm -hmm. were fulfilling the letter of the law, yes. who by doing that felt they were following God and mm -hmm. his laws and mm -hmm. seeking him, mm -hmm. don't realize it yet, but they've come to face to face with him. Mm -hmm. And he asks them the question. Yes. Who among you have, if not sinned, cast the first stone? Yes. That moment right there, too, to be open, mm -hmm. if you're truly seeking God, it caused them to stop in their tracks. Right. I mean, what a tremendous moment that yes. must have been. Yeah. I mean, how often do we have those experiences where we're so right and we're so set? Yes. And then all of a sudden, yes. we're the, the, the epiphany of yeah. being called out by God himself. Right. God can be so surprising. And in order to stay open for his surprises, we have wonderful means as Catholics to maintain this openness. For example, we have the sacrament of reconciliation. It wants to help us to be open again for whatever God wants us to do. We have the Lectio Divina. So you wonderfully described this passage from John, I can feel how deeply you have meditated it. <laughs> um, because really the scripture opens new perspectives for God. So this is, Lexio Divina is about seeking God. You are seeking what, what does God want to tell me? We have the custom of spiritual directors so as a monk, each of the monk has a spiritual director. This is a wonderful help to stay seeking. But you can even widen the view, you could say, reading a good book in general, watching a good movie. It doesn't have to have a religious content, just a good movie. Going to a museum and meditating good artwork going on a retreat, whatever it is, it all can help you to seek God. In Vatican II, in the Church in the Modern World, mm -hmm. where it talks about how God is present mm -hmm. in those who are seeking. And I, I can't help but recall Blessed Mother Teresa donning the vestiture of the Siri that is of the people Mm -hmm. of India. This is an Albanian woman. Some mm -hmm. people think she's from India. No, she was <laughs> from Albania. Yes. And yet she could see Christ, mm -hmm. even in a Hindu. Yes. It's all about seeking God. And here again we have this kind of connection between monasticism and being a missionary. So at the heart of monasticism is that the monk is seeking God. This is what he has to do. This is profession. Never stop seeking God. But this in itself is missionary because the monk is kind of by profession curious. <laughs> he wants to know where is God? Where is he? And to find him everywhere. Maybe you cannot find him really everywhere, but at least there's the possibility God could hide everywhere. And finally, there is the promise given by Jesus who said, Seek and you will find. So we are only to be concerned about seeking, not so much about finding. This is God's part. He will, he will show himself as long as we seek him. We will find him. Would you say for, for someone who is hearing this, Father Mauritius, and it does elicit some fear, mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. some concern, are you saying that there... But I, I have children who have left the church because they went and they saw it and they found something somewhere else. And mm -hmm. that's, a, I think, probably at the root of a lot of the fear mm -hmm. for the individual. Mm -hmm. As for 
those who see, for example, their children move away, fade away from the church. This is really a, a hard thing to see. And you ask yourself, what did I do wrong? What did the church do wrong? This is really saddening. But I think what helps the most is prayer and trusting God that my children will find him. What the children feel is the fear of the parents. This is what they, what they sense. Mm -hmm. they, 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 they sense it. Oh, my parents only want me to stay within the walls of the Catholic Church because they are afraid. This is what they, they get it. <laughs> mm -hmm. and, that, and so you can see this fear does not help. What helps is love and trust. So when you don't stop loving your children, whatever they do, and trusting God that he, he will go after them, <laughs> mm -hmm. that he wants to be found. Or in other words, I would interfere as a father or mother when I see my daughter, my son, does not seek anymore. Then I would be very serious. I would be very angry and confront them. So when I see, oh, they are just, they are not interested in anything, they are not seeking anymore, oh, then I would become angry. But as long as they seek the meaning of life, the purpose of life, they finally seek God. And you know, nowadays life is very long. So there's a good chance that your children will finally find him. But again, what does this mean to have found God. You know, what does this mean? What kind of ideal do I have? So as long as they seek him, in a way they have found him already. And myself, even as a parent, can I say that I have found him? Can I say that I am at the right place all the time? That I have been all the time at the right place? No, I cannot. I am still seeking. The best service you can do to your children is don't stop seeking yourself. Don't stop looking for God. When they see you with your 60 years, 70 years, 80 years, or no matter how old you are, you are still open, still learning, still seeking. Wow, that is convincing. Any final thoughts, Father Mauritius? Yeah, I would like to share with you um, an experience that I was allowed to have on my way to Santiago de Compostela. So I did this pilgrimage in 1990, long before it became trendy to do this pilgrimage, if I may say so. You're speaking of the way. The way, right. Mm -hmm. And I did this journey, or this pilgrimage, together with my students. So it was a big group of students. We did it all by food. So we were walking. And that was a long pilgrimage, and I will never forget the evening before we arrived in Santiago de Compostela. So kind of shortly before we, uh, we um, got to our, final, to our destination. We did a little reflection in the group, and everybody could share how he feels, how he is at the moment, and everybody, all, all these young people said, Oh, I'm so exciting. Tomorrow we will, we will be there. And we walked so long and tomorrow we have reached our destination. Everybody was excited, but I was sad. And, and that, was a little, that was a little bit awkward because I was the teacher. And so I was sad. I, couldn't, I wasn't joyful. And then I was honest and said, you know, I know tomorrow my feet will enter Santiago de Compostela and the cathedral, but my heart... I don't think that my heart will arrive because that was at a, at, the, at a time where I was really seeking a lot in my life. Many things were not so clear and I was, it was a, a difficult period of my life. So my heart was really wandering and this is why I loved the pilgrimage because the pilgrimage, that was kind of my mode. I was just on the way. But I hadn't arrived yet. So this is what I shared with the, my students and so I was kind of um, cool in the sense of I don't expect anything special tomorrow because I know 
even if my feet will arrive there, my heart, my journey is way longer and I will continue to be a pilgrim after Santiago de Compostela very much. Okay, so we started in the very early morning to enter into the city. First, we went in silence, so Benedictine way, you know. Mm -hmm. These were all students from our Benedictine school. So we went, walked in silence. That was so good. And then we started singing. So the whole way from the edge of the city up to the cathedral, we only were in silence or we were singing songs, we were singing, chanting. Oh, that was so wonderful. And then we entered the cathedral, and I will never forget this moment. I started crying. And at that moment, I knew that I would arrive. That was, for me, like the heaven. And since then, I know I will arrive. I will find. Seeking will have an end. This I am so sure of. Since then, I have no temptation anymore to become a Buddhist with reincarnation and stuff. Mm -hmm. One life is enough. That was the promise of God, and I could feel it. You will arrive. Don't be afraid. You will arrive. And to arrive is a gift of God. I cannot make it. In other words, it is not about that you find God. It is about that God finds you. And this is what happened at that moment. In that moment when I didn't expect it, that I would ever arrive in Santiago, so to speak, with my heart, that was this moment of seeking and of doubt. That was the moment when God came and said, you will arrive because I will find you. And I think this is how heaven is. Mm, it's beautiful. Thank you for sharing that, Father Mauritius. You're welcome. You've been listening to The Holy Rule of St. Benedict, a spiritual path for today's world with Father Mauritius Fildi. To hear and or to download this program, along with hundreds of other spiritual programs, visit discerninghearts.com. This has been a production of DiscerningHearts.com. I'm your host, Chris McGregor. We hope if this has been helpful for you that you will first pray for our mission. And if you feel us worthy, consider a charitable donation, which is fully tax-deductible, to support our efforts. But most of all, we ask that you tell a friend about DiscerningHearts.com and join us next time for The Holy Rule of St. Benedict, A Spiritual Path for Today's World with Father Mauritius Vildi.